Hello, welcome to the virtual worship service of the First Congregational Church of Lebanon, Connecticut. Whether you're an old hand at these virtual services or joining us for the first time, we welcome you. Just like to take the opportunity to let you know that we have resumed live services at our sanctuary at 588 Exeter Road in Lebanon, Connecticut, right on Route 207 at the Town Green. And here's Reverend Will. Good morning, and welcome to the First Congregational Church of Lebanon. I'm the Reverend Dr. Will Sensaba. I'm the pastor here at this church, and I am so very glad that you are here to join us in worship this morning. Hopefully, the music or the words of this service touch your heart, touch your spirit, and help you get through this really difficult time. So again, I say, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. To the members of the First Congregational Church of Lebanon. The members of the First Congregational Church of Lebanon are hereby duly warned of a special meeting on Sunday, October 25th, 2020, following our worship service for a presentation by the Board of Trustees of a preliminary budget for the year 2021. If church should be canceled on October 25th, the meeting will be held the following Sunday, November 1st, 2020, following our worship service. Thank you. I just have a quick announcement this morning, and that is with regards to our preliminary budget meeting, which is planned for October 25th on Sunday. And the meeting should be roughly about 10.45 a.m. It's following our worship service in the sanctuary. And we'd like as many people to attend as possible. And so we're offering an, an option this year. You can certainly attend in person or you can attend uh, through Zoom. And so we will have that option available. And so if people are interested in knowing what's going on at the preliminary budget meeting, they're certainly welcome to attend that via Zoom. Um, if you do plan on attending in person, we'd love for you to let us know. Uh, and that is just so we can make arrangements to make sure that we have space for everybody to meet in the sanctuary and to be physically distant uh, from one another and to follow all the restrictions uh, that apply. And so we would just like to know, again, to get a head count to be prepared for that. So if you plan on attending in person, again, we will be following all the COVID-19 uh, restrictions that are in place. And so if you are interested in attending, please let us know and so we can make, make those arrangements. And we will be sending out to our email list uh, a link for the Zoom meeting. And we'll be doing that probably a few days uh, before. Certainly look for the email uh, the week before the meeting. And so blessings to you all at this time.
mighty God, lover of justice, you've established equality among your people. We praise your awesome name. Holy God, you spoke to your people in the pillar of cloud. Speak to us now. Shape our lives by your spirit. You alone are holy. You alone are God. God, in love you created the human race and called Israel to be your people. You summoned Abraham and Sarah to follow you, so through their descendants all the peoples of the earth are blessed. Through prophets you spoke to your word of grace and judgment, and in the fullness of time you came among us, Jesus the Messiah. You call disciples in every age to follow his example of humility and service. May those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit be filled with your abundant life. And in all things, grant that we may raise hearts and voices to you in prayer and praise. In Christ's name, amen. Sing sweet. 
this morning in our service, we've been talking about change. And so recognize that there's been a lot of changes in our lives over the past several months. And many have adapted well, many have not adapted quite so well. And we know that change is hard. And it's not just the change with the pandemic, but also maybe we're feeling a change just in things around us, our own environment. And so I'm gonna ask God for guidance and for strength to help us to overcome all the changes and, and the struggles that we face uh, with those changes and all of the other things that are going on. And also ask that your prayers go out to all of those recovering from hurricanes and wildfires and the ways, the many ways in which their lives, the people's lives have changed as a result. And so let us come together before God at this time, joining together in a spirit. And so let us pray. Gracious, most holy God, there have been changes all around us. Days feel sometimes like chaos, but we know, God, that out of chaos comes order, and that order will be restored in our lives, in our communities, and in our world. So we ask and pray, God, for your sustaining love and mercy in these times. Give us the strength, God, that we need to face all of the changes. Give us hearts of compassion to dialogue with those who don't share the same worldview or share the same opinion that we have, especially in these highly charged times. We ask and pray, God, that you be with our families. Ask and pray for healing for those who are struggling with issues of health at this time. We also ask God for your strength and for your support for all of those who are still recovering from the chaos of hurricanes and wildfires and that while we go on with our lives, recognize that others' lives are completely uprooted and changed. May those folks who are going through that incredibly difficult time experience your love and your grace through the community and also through our prayers, reaching out to them. We ask and we pray for all of these things in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the fleshpots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may prove to them 
whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, before it was he has brought your murmurings against him. For what are we that you murmur against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your murmurings which you murmur against him, what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your murmurings. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked towards the wilderness and beheld the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the murmurings of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay round about the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Thus endeth the reading of the lesson. May God grant his understanding to us in the reading of his word. So let's recap. The Israelites found themselves on the eve of the Passover, and Moses and Pharaoh are battling it out with a series of plagues. And all of these plagues are leading up to the incredible 10th plague, which would claim the life of the firstborn of every Egyptian. Now we imagined what it was like to be an Israelite as these plagues occurred to have a front row seat to the awesome power of God, the God of the Israelites. We imagine the strength that it must have taken to leave Egypt. And then we imagined what it was like to flee, how difficult it must have been when coming upon the Red Sea, with the Egyptians closing in behind them and the imposing sea before them, they were hemmed in, and the possibilities were death by sword or death by drowning. Imagine the faith that it took to walk between those walls of water. The whole time that you're walking on dry land, the God of the Israelites is holding back that water. And you're thinking that at any time, those walls could come crashing down. And that would mean certain death. But as you make it through, you look back to see that the walls, in fact, have come down behind you. And when the waters calm and the dust settles on the shore, you see that the Egyptians have been engulfed in the unforgiving sea and that bodies have washed up upon the shore. You've witnessed history You've experienced firsthand the glory of God. I mean, the 10 plagues were miracles, but this is the miracle of all miracles. And now here are the Israelites in the wilderness, fresh from the miracle of deliverance, and they've assembled in a new world. They might just as well have crossed an ocean. And they ramble and they roam for some time. And they're trying to learn their way. And Moses and Aaron are trying to figure it out as they go. They had a great plan for escape, but that's as far as they got. See, the Israelites had lived their whole lives in Egypt. They were used to the misery. They were used to the routine. It was a grind, but it was the only life that they knew. So they didn't know what it was like to be free. 
You know, it's like someone who retires, right? You live your whole life doing the nine to five thing, and then you retire. And now what? I mean, sure, it's liberating, but the routine is gone. So it's time for a new routine. And maybe the same is true for prison inmates who've served extremely long sentences. They may have been incarcerated for so long that they don't know how to be free. They might not make it on the outside. And they may long to go back to the routine. People who retire may look for a part-time job, not for the money, but for the routine. And criminals may do a simple crime just so they can go back. Today's story is the surest evidence that I could use that the Bible contains truth. People are people. This story, which is thousands of years old, rings true today. People hate change. People will complain about change even when the change makes sense. I mean, think about the last time something changed in your life. I bet you didn't like it at first. I bet other people complained about it. See, we're used to a system. We function within a system. And that system always has a difficult time changing. Because if you change any input in the system, it always meets with resistance. The system doesn't want to change. So it's going to naturally reject the new input. However, if you don't change an input in the system, it will always function the same way. Because that's what the system's designed to do. We all function within a system. We all function within a system. It may be a family system or a work system or a church system. But change causes resistance. I've experienced this with hurtful results and you probably have too. For the Israelites, everything changed. All the inputs changed at once. They were still Israelites. They were still sons and daughters of Jacob. They were still the people chosen by their powerful God. But now they were homeless. Now they were all strangers in a strange land. They had their customs and their rituals and their stories. See, this period, the wilderness period, it's a defining moment in their history. It's this defining moment that seems to start with them complaining in the wilderness. We have nothing to eat. We have nothing to drink. You brought us out here to die. Let's talk about the change curve. It shouldn't surprise you that the stages of the change curve eerily resemble the stages of grief. When the system that sustains us changes, we mourn the loss of comfort. If you'd like, think about some time in your life when something changed. And you can see how this applies to your situation. The first stage of the change curve, the first stage of change is shock and denial. The Israelites were in shock. They survived the most traumatic experience of their lives. They escaped 10 hard-hitting plagues only to be thrown into the most harrowing and unique experience of walking through the Red Sea. They left their home, their job, their way of life, and now they had to completely start over. The second stage of change is anger, fear, depression. 
the Israelites move to being angry and fearful about their fate. I mean, listen to their words. You have brought us out here into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. They use the word kill. There's anger behind those words. Did they really believe that Moses wanted to kill off the Israelites? No, but they were angry. People say things that are raw and hurtful when they're angry. They were afraid for their future. And people lash out at others when they're afraid. People actively resist or protest against the changes. So if this stage, the stage of anger, fear, and depression, if it isn't handled with care, then this stage could spiral into chaos. So the third stage is acceptance and integration. So people begin to focus on what was lost. People begin to let up and accept change. They begin testing and exploring what that change means. But it takes time to get there. But this is when people really begin to embrace the change. So like the stages of grief, people move through the stages of the change curve independently and on their own timeline. It took the Israelites 40 years to move through the stages, but it's only when they had completely changed their system that it was time to move on to a new thing, the promised land. Now, I have seen this theory play out in churches. I've seen it play out in jobs and in relationships. And I have no doubt that each of us has had this experience play out in our own lives. Think of a change in your life. Did you experience these same things? And it might have been when you got the latest version of the iPhone. You didn't want to give up your old one because you were so comfortable with that one and with the new one. And now you got to learn all of these new things, right? It means new apps and it means updating and it means expanding your own personal knowledge. How to use the operating system. All of us have had jobs. Think about changes related to our jobs. You get a new printer. You like the old one better. You get a new boss. Yeah, you like the old one better. You get a new pastor. You like the old one better. You get a new car. Well, forget that because everybody always likes the new car better than the old car. But we all like the old car payment better than the new car payment. Is the new thing worth it? Is the change to the system worth it? Was it worth it to the Israelites to experience the shock and the anger of leaving the only world that they knew for the unknown, bleak wilderness? See, I think Moses was a genius because he figured it out. He led the people by walking them on a 40-year journey through the change curve without really losing the Israelites. He didn't just leave them. He didn't just lead them from the bondage of slavery to the promised land flowing with milk and honey. He led them from shock and anger to acceptance. See, if you want a different result, change an input in the system. Because if the system changes, and it will, people will need time.
to accept and embrace changes. And when people resist, and they will, if you're doing what is right, keep doing it. And have faith that the awesome God who delivered the Israelites will deliver you. That awesome God who guided the Israelites will guide you through any systemic change in your life. And have faith that the awesome God who guided Moses will guide you and will grant you the wisdom to make the changes that you need to make. And that same God will be true to the ultimate goal. And God will be with you. And God will guide you every step of the way. Amen. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take my cross and follow, follow. May God bless you and may God's face shine upon you in these difficult times. May God give you the strength and guide you through every change of life. In Jesus' name, amen.